Today's episode is about a very important photograph that has been talked about a lot. It's been talked about so much that I didn't think there was anything left to say about it. But once again, after researching it, I uncovered not one, but two unpublished secrets behind this photograph. And once again, I can't wait to share those with you. Welcome to the second episode of Secrets Behind the Photograph. I'm your host, Dr. Segui. I am a street photographer based in Los Angeles. Before we start our little investigation about Migrant Mother, let me clarify that this video is not about critiquing the photograph itself. You can find lots of other videos on YouTube that have done that. My goal today is to break new ground. I'm here to reveal the secret of how this photograph was taken and what we can learn from it for our own photography. Now, how does that sound? Now, let's start with a bit of background about this image. It was made in 1936 by Dorothea Lange. It is by far the single most recognizable image of the Great Depression and one of the most famous documentary photographs of all time. When Dorothea Lange shot this photograph, she was working for the Resettlement Administration, which was renamed the Farm Security Administration, or FSA, a year later in 1937. It was a federal agency created by FDR as part of the New Deal to document and remedy the plight of the poor. Now, to better understand what happened that day at a pea pickers camp in Nipomo, California, let's take a quick look at Lang's career up to then. Lang was born in 1895, and she contracted polio at the age of seven, the poor thing, which left her with a limp for the rest of her life. In high school, Lang decided she would become a photographer even before owning a camera or even taking her first photograph. Why? She loved observing people in the street, and she dreamed of being able to capture those moments. It's only in college at Columbia University in New York that she started studying portrait photography. And she soon after moved to San Francisco, where she opened a portrait studio in 1920 and married an established painter with whom she had two kids. Now, her work at the time mostly involved shooting portraits of San Francisco's social elite. Her customers were quite wealthy, and she was able to generate a pretty good income from this business. At least she did until the Great Depression hit, and many of her customers lost their fortunes. And that's when she started taking her camera to the street to document bread lines and other symbols of the Great Depression. This was initially just a personal project, but it quickly caught the attention of the media and landed her job with the Federal Resettlement Administration. Now, bear in mind that Lang's camera was not the tiny little Leica that Cartier-Bresson had used only four years earlier to make his iconic photograph behind Garcin Lazar. You know, the one we talked about on the last episode. Lang's camera was a massive Graflex Super D 4x5 camera. Now, see how that looks in comparison? It was also much slower to operate because it required to change large 4x5 negatives between shots. Not exactly the most stealth camera for the street. That said, it was designed to be shot handheld, which is quite remarkable for a camera this size. It was also very expensive at the time. It cost roughly one third of the price of a new car. And this was at a time when cars were quite expensive relative to people's income. Now, she had learned from her studio work how to compose a photograph and how to put her subjects at ease with conversation. And she was a resourceful and creative entrepreneur who had grown a successful business and managed to raise two kids as a working mom. So now that we have a better idea of who Lang was, let's look at what happened that day. Now the good news here is we do have an entire series of photographs that Lang made during the shoot. How many photographs depends who you ask. Most reports about the shoot, including Lang's own account, refer to a series of only five photographs. Some better research reports mention a sixth photograph, this one. But digging a little further, I was able to find a seventh photograph to the series, and it's quite a remarkable one, because it's the only close-up portrait in which Florence Owens looks straight into the camera. Now let's examine all seven images and try to spot clues that might shed light on how the final iconic image was made. Image number one, Lang is approaching the family. This shot might be entirely candid for all we know. Only one face is fully visible, the face of one of her little girls staring into the camera as children that age often do. Some kids that age have a really hard time following instructions not to stare as they have very little to no self-awareness. 
I know because my kids were the same at that age and it was impossible to make them not stare at things. <laughs> Image number two, Lang arranges the whole family for a group portrait. She likely asks the teenage daughter to bring out the rocking chair from inside the tent and sit on it. But there's a bulky object in the chair that causes the teenager to have an awkward pose. Lang probably realizes that her case is better made without the teenage daughter anyway. She knows from experience that younger kids are more effective for the type of propaganda work that she does for the government. But working with young children comes with its own challenges. Note how the little girl from the first image still has the same grimacing expression on her face. So let's see how Lang deals with that. Image number three. Lang decides to isolate the mother for this Madonna and child pose. Now this time, she might find the setting a little too cliche and realizes it lacks the context of the bigger family, which is highly relevant to the story she's trying to tell. So she tweaks things once again. Image number four. She adds the younger daughter back in. Yes, that's the one who had the grimacing expression in the first two images. This is the rare photograph that very few people know about. It's also the only image where the subjects look directly into the camera. Now bear in mind, they're not looking at the photographer here because Lang is composing the shot by looking down into the large viewfinder of her graphics camera. So the two subjects have clearly been instructed to look into the lens. Now, why is that? My guess is that she can't pose the child to act candid and look away from the camera. And she also can't have just mom looking away while the kid is staring at the camera. So, as the excellent problem solver that she is, Lang instructs both subjects to look into the camera. And that's why this rare image is the only one that has mom looking directly at the camera. At least that's the best explanation I can find. And I think it's pretty convincing. Image number five, Lang changes it up again and she tries the same idea, but with the older sister this time. And the older sister can follow directions. And it's working a bit better, as you can see here even though the child seems a little self-conscious. It's hard for a child that age to act because unlike the younger kids, they have become a little too self-conscious. Note that Lang has framed this image vertically, probably to include the empty plate in the foreground. She obviously is not quite satisfied with this framing because her next image is back to landscape mode. Maybe the empty plate idea was a bit too literal for her taste. Image number six. Lang tries to get the same shot in landscape mode and a bit more close up, but at this point, either the proximity of the camera or the long time posing makes the girl a lot more self-conscious looking. And you can see that from her mouth expression here. Now, note how Owens has a great candid expression every single time. She's a total natural. Image number seven. This is Lang's eureka moment. This is where you see her decades of experience as a portrait photographer come to bear with all the problem solving and composition genius to boot. She knows by now that mom can deliver a great candid expression every single time. So she makes her the star of the show. She even instructs Owens to hold her hand to her face as she often did on other photographs. It provides a leading line that gives emphasis to the mother's great facial expression. All of this is well and good, but Lang also knows by now that she needs the two young children in the frame for context. And she also knows that neither of them can pose properly to save their life. So how does she solve for this? Yep, you got it. She adds both little girls in, but this time without showing their faces. And that's our first secret of this two-part episode. Of course, there's no way to prove this, but I hope you'll admit that it's quite a convincing argument. I've conducted in-depth research about this photo, and to my knowledge, no one has ever quite cracked the mystery of why Lang arranged the children this way. But don't go yet. We're just getting to the most useful part of this episode, what we can learn from it to improve our own photography. Now, what's amazing here is that we have a series of images that give us a window into what Lang is thinking as she wrestles with the scene to solve various problems, how to compose it, who to include, who to exclude, how to arrange the subjects based on their own individual abilities to deliver on her vision as a master portrait photographer. Now, before I go any further into the teachings of this episode, I want to address the elephant in the room. Some of you might be taken aback by the fact that Lang posed her subjects in this series. 
I'm a photojournalist myself by training, so I understand this type of concern. Now, let me clarify that there is a legitimate subgenre of documentary photography where it's okay to pose and arrange subjects. What might throw you off, though, in Lang's work is that she poses her subjects to look candid. And I'll concede that it's a bit ethically borderline. At least it is today. But it might have been okay at the time, so I wouldn't be too quick to judge. Aside from this candid versus posed controversy, what can we learn so far from this iconic shoot? Well, the first teaching I would extract from this is that personal projects can lead to great things, especially when they're carried out out of genuine personal interest and executed with great passion. Here, we learn that Lang's passion for documenting the condition of the poor during the Great Depression ended up basically making her distinguished career. I believe personal projects can do great things for your photography career as well. If you're curious about finding your own personal project, make sure to check out the presentation I gave on this topic at the BNH event space in late 2019. Second teaching is that approaching people and developing a technique for making them comfortable with your presence pays off. Many street photographers out there are either afraid of approaching strangers or they've been taught to stay invisible. But it often doesn't work. They often have to stay relatively far, shoot from the hip, and use telephoto lenses, all of which is a recipe for disappointment, frankly. Imagine if Lang had tried to steal this photograph from afar to avoid getting noticed. She would never have been able to capture the scene in such an intimate way. Personally, I only shoot candid street photography, so I would never pose or stage a scene like Lang did. But connecting with people and gaining access by earning their trust has been a very important part of my process. It's also one of the most fulfilling parts of street photography, frankly, in my opinion. I have the privilege to travel into people's lives, total strangers whom I would never have had a chance to meet if it wasn't for photography. How enriching is that? I've had dozens of students actually join my masterclass because they want to learn how to approach and photograph strangers without fear. Once they study my techniques, it's a total game changer for them. And I'm not saying to only do it that way. You can also try to stay invisible sometimes. But this is a technique that really adds a lot of options for you when you're in the street and staying invisible is not an option. Another teaching here is that thoroughly working a scene and problem solving as you go is an absolute must. Now, very rarely does one capture a great moment with a single shot. Great images usually require working a scene for a while and you never know when the absolute peak moment will reveal itself. So you have to stay with it, problem solve and try different things just like Dorothea Lang did here. This photograph of mine won the Miami Photo Festival competition in 2019 and it was also published in a number of magazines including National Geographic. This image emerged after about 45 minutes of shooting the scene. Yes, 45 minutes of staying with it. Now, from my experience teaching, very few photographers work their scenes enough. And even when they try, they often don't know what to solve for. This kind of problem solving is precisely what I teach in my masterclass, and I provide a simple and easy method to follow that guides you so you can end up capturing that decisive moment beautifully. So there you have it. We've unlocked a secret behind one of the most iconic images of all time, and we've extracted some great teachings to improve our photography. That's exactly what this YouTube series is all about. Now, what do you think? I'd love to get your comments below or even just a like if you've enjoyed this video. But stay tuned for the second part of this episode where I will reveal another unpublished secret about my grandmother, which I think you'll find even more surprising. This second part of the episode will only be released on my own YouTube channel. So please be sure to go and subscribe to my new personal channel right now at youtube.com slash dsagui. That's D-S-A-G-U-Y. And as always, if you're interested in taking your street photography to the next level, I invite you to check out my online masterclass. Here's a link to the quick video overview of my masterclass if you're curious, and there's even a coupon code for you. So check it out.